Welcome back to the Dirt Diaries Explorers, especially those who are lounging in the villa, taking notes in the library, and of course, snooping in the restricted section. I hope you guys loved the last episode concerning ancient pettiness, because who doesn't love ancient gossip? And today we are taking a hard right turn, if you will, in both time and space. We're heading to the east and looking at the first emperor of China. If you haven't heard of him or, say, the state of Qin, you may recognize the terracotta army that guards his tomb. And this episode was actually inspired by my senior thesis for my undergraduate degree. For my archaeology program in undergrad, we actually had to pick, I believe it was like an archaeological site or like a find or something. And while my college specialized in the Eastern Mediterranean world between the Near East and especially Egypt and those connections, my senior year, we also got a new professor in who she specializes in Mesoamerican archaeology. So I don't know why my brain was like, you know what? While there are these great options, let's go completely left field and do ancient China. But this has been probably a topic I've always been drawn to. This was actually one of the major components of why I became an archaeologist, fun fact. I know if you've been listening to Dirt Diaries for a while, you know, back in the first episode, I kind of talked about, you know, how I got to where I am today. And in sixth grade, yes, we were learning about Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt and Greek mythology and everything. But we also covered ancient China. And I don't know how we were able to be shown certain videos in class because it was definitely from like the History Channel or like National Geographic or something that was based on the period of the Warring States and showing how the state of Qin, spoiler alert, unified China. And I remember watching in sixth grade, literally these actors getting beheaded to showcase like the warfare in ancient China and everything. And I don't know why, but at that point I was like, yes, I want to look into ancient China, the first emperor and his terracotta army. So that's really what inspired today's episode. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. But of course, before we can dive into the period of the Warring States, the First Emperor and more, we of course have our bi-weekly housekeeping. Don't forget to join Patreon where there is extra content for all of you history lovers out there. There are three tiers to fit your needs. The Villa is great for those looking for extra bite-sized history videos for you to soak up extra knowledge, you know, just in case you're ever called in to answer those odd Jeopardy or trivia questions. The library is perfect for those looking for ad-free and early access to podcasts and extra content from me. I just uploaded a video from one of my favorite top finds since I'm always asked about what's your favorite archaeology finds? What's your favorite archaeological site? Which site could you wish that you could have dug at? All of those questions I'm now answering on Patreon and I picked the first one to start with and he is a little prehistoric hedgehog from a cycladic cemetery and he's so cute. He's one of my absolute favorites. And I hope you guys adore him, and I cannot wait to break down more favorite finds. And last but not least, there is the restricted section for those who love archaeology and ancient history as much as I do, where you get bonus episodes, bibliographies for further reading, and book reviews. And since we're doing book reviews, should I start like an ancient history lovers book club? Let me know. And the last thing on the list is to remember that on the Friday before the newest episode of the Dirt Diaries podcast, I launch Friday Finds up on YouTube, breaking down some of my favorite archaeological discoveries from the previous two weeks. This past one that came out on Friday covered the new Hermes statue found in Bulgaria, the possible discovery of where the gladiator Spartacus was held, and the world's oldest wine found in liquid form because we love ancient food here. And now that, you know, housekeeping is out of the way, we can make our way to China around the 5th century BCE. And while the first emperor doesn't appear on the scene until the 3rd century BCE, we need to really talk about what's going on right now. Welcome to the period of the Warring States. So prior to the first emperor, China is in turmoil in a sense, as a Game of Thrones is about to begin. During the 5th century BCE, the Eastern Zhou dynasty was declining, and when a dynasty begins to crumble, predators begin circling. The Zhou were being surpassed on the field in terms of military, and as such, they were forced to align themselves with allied states that began to not have the Zhou's best interest in mind. And as the 4th century begins, 
by this time, there are nearly a hundred smaller states that due to conquest were consolidated into the seven major states of the time. The Chu, the Han, the Qi, the Qin, the Wei, the Yan, and the Zhao. Each of these seven states had its own individual who had declared himself king and thus independent of the Zhou Empire. They began looking at their rival's land to take it for their own. And between 535 and 286 BCE, which I know is a couple hundred years, there were over 350 wars between the seven power players. The art of war was gone in a sense. These commanders campaigned ruthlessly as the ultimate prize was a unified China under their state. And because I am an ancient warfare kind of girl, let's talk about it. This type of warfare was never before seen in this area. Mongolian steeds bore a cavalry of mounted archers, and new iron weapons such as swords and crossbows were given to large armies, now based on universal conscription. In a sense, the slower organized battles of the past were no more. In their place was dynamic warfare with disciplined troop deployments and even espionage, which became vital in victories. Battles were fought by hundreds of thousands, where previously only 10,000 stood. The Qin, the Qi, and the Chu states each possessed a total infantry force of close to 1 million men, with a cavalry 10,000 strong, meaning these battles were no longer a few days long, but became a marathon of power struggles fought on all sides of the state to ensure expansion and destroy the enemy's military might. So the state of Qin did have some advantages. They were on the periphery, meaning they had more freedom to expand into territory not held by a rival and a protective mountain range on their eastern border. Due to the principles of legalism, which of course has an emphasis placed on laws and procedures, they developed a strong and organized government that allowed for a chain of command to run the provinces, an economy to fund and field large, well-equipped armies, and more meaning the Qin could begin taking a more ambitious course of actions to ensure conquest. The Qin conquered the kingdom of Shu in 316 BCE, and the state of Chu fell in 278 BCE. In 260, a great victory was won against the Zhao after a three-year battle. Following this, the king of the Zhou dies in 256, and no heir is appointed following his death. So the Qin moves in to take the remains of that state. In 246 BCE, Ying Zheng ascended to the throne to rule the Qin at the age of 13. And just over two decades later, the Han falls in 230, the Zhao falls in 228, the Wei in 225, the Chu in 223, and finally, the Qi and the Yan fell in 221 BCE. If you followed along, that means that after centuries of war, the Qin formed a unified empire across China, and their king, Zheng, changed his name to Shi Huangdi, meaning first emperor. So let's talk about who exactly he was. During his rule, the state of Qin standardized coins, weights, and measures, they interlinked the states with canals and roads, and he is credited for building the first version of the Great Wall. He divided the lands into 36 command areas. Each was supervised by a governor, a military commander, and an imperial inspector, all of whom reported back to him. And Emperor Qin Shi Huang relocated hundreds of thousands of influential families from their home provinces to the capital, where he could watch them closely. He brutally suppressed dissent. Some accounts say that over 450 scholars were rounded up and executed, and the texts that these scholars had used to criticize the government were confiscated and burned. Massive amounts of book burnings took place. Citizens of all ranks were encouraged to inform on one another. Those convicted of crimes were executed, mutilated, or even put to hard labor. And because of his reign, it's probably not shocking to hear that there were multiple assassination attempts on his life. And around this time that, you know, multiple attempts are taken on his life, 
Chin Chi Huang became obsessed, you could say, with discovering the powers of immortality. Surely a man who began an empire saw great things ahead, but as always, he was bound to the human lifespan. He needed more time to accomplish his goals. His advisors counseled him that the herbs of immortality would not work until he could move around unobserved. Accordingly, he built walkways and passages connecting his palaces so that he could move about in seemingly invisibility. Documents found back in 2002 reveal that over 2,200 years ago, Emperor Qin Shi Huang even put out an executive order to search for a potion that would give him eternal life. The analysis of 48 medicine-related slips from this collection found that the emperor's decree to search for immortality potions reached frontier regions and remote villages. This was widespread, you guys. He was not going to stop until he found, basically, the herbs to make this potion for immortality. The wooden slips even contained some responses from these villages. One town reported back to the emperor that its inhabitants hadn't yet found the elixir of life, while another town in eastern China offered an herb from a local mountain. So during this time, people are going to locals, they are asking them, do you know what can extend the lifespan? And he is willing to try just about anything. So much so that the emperor was even thought to have consumed cinnabar, which if you don't know what cinnabar is, it is mercury sulfide. And he did so in hopes that it would prolong his life. But if you know anything about anything, it's that mercury is hella poisonous. To help him on his quest for immortality, alchemists informed the emperor that magical herbs could be found on what they claimed were three islands of the immortals in the eastern China Sea. Around 219 BCE, Qin Shi Huang reportedly dispatched several thousand youngsters to search for the islands. They never returned. A few years later, the emperor sent three alchemists to retrieve the herbs. One of them made it back, recounting a tale of a giant fish guarding the islands. And legend has it that the emperor resolved to lead the next search party himself. And on the expedition, he used a repeating crossbow to kill a huge fish. But instead of discovering the immortality elixirs on his journey, he apparently contracted a fatal illness. And as a man on a quest for immortality, if he couldn't live forever, he wanted to ensure that he would be well-equipped for the afterlife. So to do so, he had an enormous tomb built. This enormous tomb and buried terracotta hoard was constructed at a tremendous cost by over 700,000 forced labor conscripts. The thousands of life-sized figures included infantrymen, archers, chariots with horses, officials, servants, and even entertainment such as those who are musicians and even a strongman. They are arrayed in military formation. These soldiers bear traces of the bright paint that once enlivened them. Although these soldiers and other terracotta individuals were formed from standardized pieces with solid legs and hollow torsos, they were evidently finished by hand so that no two figures looked exactly alike. So what does that mean? It means that these terracotta figures were likely made in molds so that you could mass produce them because, spoiler alert, over 8,000 have been excavated. But... If you're using a mold, well, then they're always going to look the same. So how do you differentiate them? Well, you have artisans work continuously on them to ensure that their paint is going to be different. Expressions are going to be different. Armor, similar, but also different to highlight their ranks, their status. All of that stuff was done by hand. The ancient army was stationed just east of a necropolis surrounding the tomb of Qin Shi Huangdi, where his soldiers would guard him in the afterlife. He also brought, of course, the entertainment with him as well, such as acrobats and musicians. But when the quest for immortality did not work and, you know, likely his life may have been shortened by ingesting mercury, he passes away at the age of 49 in 210 BCE. And when he passes, the tomb was still a work in progress. 
And a year after his death, uprisings actually halted the project in 209 BCE. And just two years later, the Qin dynasty was no more. And what's really interesting is this is kind of a recent find. His terracotta army and necropolis were really only recently discovered in the second half of the 20th century. Workers were digging in a well outside the city of Xi'an in 1974 and struck upon one of the greatest archaeological discoveries in the world, a life-size clay soldier poised for battle. These farmers, they were just working on a well and they had no idea that they were literally standing on top of something. Of course, archaeologists were immediately called in and they began excavations and they found not one but now 8,000 clay soldiers, each with unique facial expressions and positioned according to rank. And though largely gray today, patches of paint hint at once brightly colored clothes. Further excavations have revealed swords, arrow tips, and other weapons, many in pristine condition. The emperor's tomb itself remains unexcavated, however, though Sima Qian's writings suggest even greater treasures. One of his texts in translation reads, the tomb was filled with models of palaces, pavilions, and offices, as well as fine vessels, precious stones, and rarities. The account indicates that the tomb contains replicas of the area's rivers and streams made of mercury that flows to the sea through hills and mountains made of bronze. Precious stones such as pearls are said to represent the sun, moon, and other stars It's unclear how many of the ancient descriptions are exaggerations, though soil samples around the tomb have indicated high levels of mercury contamination. Three major pits are easily accessible and are enclosed inside Emperor Qin Chi Huangdi's Mausoleum Site Museum, which was constructed around the discovery site and has been open since 1979. In one pit, long columns of warriors have been reassembled from broken pieces and they stand in formation with their top knots or caps, their tunics or armored vests, their goatees or close cropped beards. The soldiers exhibit astonishing individuality. A second pit inside the museum demonstrates how they appeared when they were found. Some stand upright, buried to their shoulders in soil while others lie toppled on their backs alongside fallen and cracked clay horses. But earlier this year, reports came out about a tomb being excavated among the terracotta warriors. This tomb has been known about since 2011, but rules prevent further excavations to continue. At best, you can just note that there is a tomb here and work to prevent any looters and just work to protect it. That is until earlier this year, where heavy rain threatened to destroy parts of the site and archaeologists were actually called in and permitted to remove the coffins from the ground, including the one suspected of belonging to Prince Gao. The tomb showed no signs of looting or raiding, but it was considerably decayed. Given the opulence of the tomb and its contents, researchers are confident that it must have belonged to a high-ranking warrior perhaps even the emperor's own son, Prince Gao. And according to the records of the Grand Historian, which is an epic history of China written by our good man, Sima Qian, spanning from the late 2nd century BCE until 91 BCE, Prince Gao requested to be killed and laid to rest with his father at the mausoleum. However, researchers have actually contested the accuracy of this record, given some of its outlandish claims. Instead, they say, it's more likely that the coffin holds the remains of another high-ranking official. And now researchers are examining the coffin for clues as to who was buried inside. And perhaps, maybe, Chan was correct. And hopefully, we'll be able to hear about more updates with this. And as we move to closing remarks and final thoughts, Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi is such an interesting character. Yes, he climbs to the top of the state of Qin. He ascends to rule at the age of 13. And when you think about how young some of these rulers in ancient history are, you have to stop and think that these are kids. 
And it really makes you, you know, kind of draw parallels with Game of Thrones of children fighting in their parents' wars. But Emperor Chen Shi Huangdi was born into this. He was born to be a military leader. He was born for conquest and out of conquest, if you will. And he certainly left his mark on history. And of course, while the rule of Shi Huangdi is, whew, it is, it is crazy. It is a little dark at times, and it's filled with a lot of paranoia because, I mean, how could it not be? He is the first emperor. He's having multiple assassination attempts on his life, and he's really implementing rules and laws that are really centered around individuals turning on one another, individuals selling each other out, which is not going to create the best kind of... ah. Uh, community, if you will. There's a lot of lack of trust going on. And it's interesting. He took a similar approach to our guy Akhenaten in New Kingdom Egypt. He is moving all of his elites to the capital with him because he trusts nobody. And we saw the same thing happen with Akhenaten, which again goes the saying as old as time, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. So I understand that. And while he is credited with, you know, kind of the first implementation of the Great Wall of China, it came at the cost of hundreds of thousands of lives. And for the most part, doing research on him and diving back into this topic that really gripped me for my senior thesis, this man is still almost seen as a mythical leader because archaeologists have yet to open up his tomb. But yeah, I'm really interested to see if this new coffin that was excavated from the tomb that was, you know, potentially going to get destroyed by the heavy rains this season. I think it came out in March or April, this article. But I'm really interested to see if they are actually able to open it because I do know that the rules and laws and regulations, especially in China, are a lot different in terms of archaeology. So if they are able to open up this coffin, I'm really going to be interested to see, was Sima Qian actually correct? And is it the son of Shi Huangdi? Or was it just another high-ranking official? And yeah, I, I really also do wonder if this tomb, the emperor's tomb, is actually ever going to be opened in our lifetime. Just because of rules, regulations, and putting all that aside, but there's also super high toxicity levels with how high the levels of mercury are in the soil. So man, it would be utterly incredible to be able to open that up and see, are there rivers of mercury and bronze mountains and these dioramas of palaces and everything and the stars and constellations that are up on the ceiling? Like, what is it like in there? What was it like to build this? But where he ruled with an iron fist, it ultimately came at the cost of, I would ultimately say, his dynasty. Because following his death, the dynasty of the Qin only outlasted him by a few years. And while his quest for immortality, you know, didn't end well because he was ingesting mercury, a piece of him does live on today. It's actually believed that the Qin dynasty and the name Qin actually lent its hand to the name China, which is super interesting to think about that where Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi couldn't find the potion for immortality. If this is true, he in a sense is still living on in the name now, which is eerily poetic in a sense. So there you have it. The first emperor of China born out of the period of the Warring States. He was a man born of conquest, who built his empire in blood, immortalized in the name of the country today, and forever guarded by thousands of terracotta warriors. He is the man whose mysterious and legendary tomb still brings in thousands of tourists every single year to gaze upon the first emperor of China and his terracotta army. And of course, as we're wrapping up, don't forget, in my off weeks, you can catch me on Sticks and Bones with Chelsea and 10. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, follow wherever you get your podcasting goodies. And what do you guys think of the first emperor of China? Was he a good leader? What do you think about his terracotta army? And do you think archaeologists will ever open up his tomb? Let me know.
But in the meantime, I will see all of you over on the Villa, the Library, and the Restricted section on Patreon. And as always, keep your books open, stay curious, and I'll see you guys next time on The Dirt Diaries. 